All right, hi everybody. Um, thank you for being here on Saturday. Um, I'm really excited to be here. My blood composition is like one-third caffeine right now, which is helping. Um, so I am just gonna briefly introduce myself and then this uh, new set of speakers and then we'll moderate the panel. So my name is Daniel Aldana Cohen. I'm an assistant professor of sociology at the University of Pennsylvania, although this year I'm at the Stan Cup Institute for Advanced Study in New Jersey. So I'm living in a suburb for the first time in my life. It is extremely hellish. Um, and I hope that some combination of new urbanists and others can fix that. Um, okay, so um, I love this presentation. Um, I think that this is a moment where climate change reporting is often extremely dour and gloomy. Um, I just wrote something in the nation arguing that actually the reporting of the IPCC report misses the fact that it's in many ways very optimistic and points to the ways in which technology and equality and feminism together provide a very, very realistic pathway toward decarbonizing quickly enough to avoid major catastrophe. Um, so I think that often in the broad like left as conceived, there is this debate, will it be technology or social change? And what I think is happening today is we're gonna not fall into that simplistic dichotomy, but see the ways in which technological and social change feed each other. And so that raises a whole series of really fascinating questions, many of which were just prompted, but we'll get to more in the table, um, into, the, into the panel. Um, and then of course the central question, right, is like justice, equality, where does that fit in? And in New York is a very interesting time because we have a mayor whose sustainability plan is called One NYC and is all about equity. So the first speaker that we'll have, uh, Jennifer Robertson, um, comes from the mayor's office of sustainability. Um, her bio is in the pamphlet, I won't go through it, but um, we'll speak uh, very powerfully to questions of integrating the complexities of these new um, technologies for de, um, decarbonizing transit into the city. How does that work? Kind of getting into the nuts and bolts. Although I fear that nuts and bolts is a metaphor from a previous age, and actually <laughs> there are other words we should use to describe the very tiny things um, which constitute the physical details. Um, and then after that, we'll hear from Mimi Scheller, who is really the kind of leading thinker in critical social science on mobilities, mobility justice, thinking about mobility in a very holistic and powerful way connected to a whole other, uh, a whole series of social forces from urbanization uh, to everyday life and so on. Um, and before we hear from them, we'll actually have a, a recorded conversation, which I've already watched, and it is really great, um, with Bruce Scheller, who is currently a transportation consultant. Again, his bio, I don't know if his bio does justice to the fact that he was really for a very long time the guy in the city for planning transportation. The debates around congestion pricing in NYC, he wrote a very nice uh, academic treatment of it that was himself really a protagonist of this issue. So um, I don't think anybody knows the intersection of politics, uh, technology, transportation policy in New York better than uh, Bruce does, and his conversation really reflects that, but it's not rehashing the old debates of the 2000s, um, but it is a very forward-looking meditation on things to, to balance and to, to take into account when we kind of imagine making a new mobility in the future. So I'm really thrilled to have these presentations, um, and afterwards we'll bring up uh, Anthony as well and have a panel conversation. I'll put out a couple of questions and then we'll open it up to the audience, to all of you. So to understand what's happening on the streets of New York today, you should go back 25 years. You should look at it in that kind of a time frame. If you go back to the 1990s, the 2000s, the early 2010s, is you saw increases in public transportation ridership. You saw first a stabilization and then declines in, the, in auto usage and auto ownership in the city. Um, and you saw new forms of transportation, people biking more, for example. And so as the city grew in population and the city grew in employment and tourism, all the things that we know um, in terms of the city getting larger, it came to be in the 2010s, early 2010s, that all of the growth of the city was absorbed, it, the growth in travel that came from the growth of the city was absorbed in the public transportation system. And that was a path of sustainable growth. And it was one that we could see, we could look forward, we could look in time and see that continuing as far as we could see. Then what happened starting around 2013, 2014, is we had, we've had increased auto ownership, and of course we've had the arrival of 
ride hail companies, Uber and Lyft. Um, and people switching first just from yellow cabs, so it was basically just a substitution, and then an overall increase in the amount of for hire travel when you add up yellow cabs, green cabs, Uber, Lyft, car services, black cars, the whole for hire sector has grown tremendously, first in Manhattan and then throughout the city. Some of those are just really strict improvements to mobility, I think, when you get to the outer parts of the boroughs, and some of them are really causing an overload on our streets, and we, we see that most acutely in Manhattan. And so that's what people are seeing and feeling. The numbers certainly bear, bear that out in terms of slower speeds, in terms of harder to get to where you want to go. Um, and that's the, sort of the crisis that we're in now, is we have less public transportation use, we have more auto use of all kinds that's straining the system in ways that are unsustainable, and the city can't maintain that, much less grow, if those trends continue. What we're all used to is, two, is essentially two modes of transportation, aside from your own car, although it fits into it too. On the one hand, you have what we've always thought is a taxi cab. It, it picks you up where you are, takes you to exactly where you want to go. It's exclusive ride, door-to-door um, -door service. On the other hand, we, we've had the public transportation system. You walk to a stop, you get picked up, it's shared, and then you walk to your final destination from where you're dropped off. The idea to Uber and Lyft when it started was that first it would be like a taxi cab because you need a density of trips, but then it would become a shared ride service. And via a microtransit service or chariot are like this. So the idea was for Uber and Lyft that they would still pick you up at your doorstep and take you to where you want to go, but it would be shared, so it would be more efficient. What they found over time was that in order to make that work, you end up with a zigzag route. In fact, sometimes you go opposite the direction you want to go, particularly in a one-way street grid. Everyone wants to go north, but you have to go south to pick someone up. People hate this. This doesn't work at all. So what Uber and Lyft are doing now is they're saying, OK, we'll designate a place for you to walk a block or two, and we'll pick you up there, and the same thing on the other end. Many people have pointed out that looks like a bus. And of course, it does. It starts to move toward public transportation. It's still on demand. The pickup and drop off points might be predefined, or they might be defined on the fly, the same thing with the route. But it moves toward just like public transportation, shared walk and wait type of a service. The conclusion that I've drawn from all this, and I've been talking to people and trying to test if there's some other way to look at this, and so far I, I think there isn't, is that we're still, you go back to the horse-drawn taxi and the horse-drawn tram, that's still where we are. Two modes of transportation. One is exclusive ride, doorstep to destination. The other is shared and you walk and wait at a stop. You can do that with a bus, which seats 60 or has 60 people capacity. You can do that, obviously, with subways. Um, you could do it with uh, six-person via minivans. You can do it with 12 or 14-person vehicles, a whole range of vehicles. But once you get beyond one or two people, strangers traveling together, you can't really effectively do door-to-door -door service where people have diffuse origins and destinations. You need to get people walking a little bit. And so that's what we're back to. And the size of the vehicle and the way you arrange all this depends on where you are. In Manhattan, you need the big vehicles because you need the high capacity because you only have limited amount of street space. If you get to Arlington, uh, Texas, for example, where VIA is doing a pilot, their six-person vans work out very well. And they can both do a lot of shared rides from the train station to employment centers as well as serving a diffuse number of, of travel patterns within the city. So it depends a lot on where you are. And where we are right now, both in the city and I think nationally, is figuring out with these sort of new tools that we have, on-demand service, smartphone apps, um, drivers who work part-time and are flexible in their work hours. You have all these changes and exactly what fits what slot, how can they support higher capacity modes? What overloads the street system? And what's an acceptable amount of additional vehicle mileage to have? And so all very time and place uh, context sensitive.
right. So there's a huge amount that technology brings to this because you can use a phone and say where you are. It's much more transparent. You can see how long until the vehicle arrives for you. Um, you can file a complaint. You can see what you can add your tip. You can do all of these different things. And so people think of trans technology as being transformative. It's transformative to the end-to-end -end user experience. But it's not transformative to how many square feet of street space we have. The geometry remains the same. And so the geometric aspects of this problem remain the same. And that's why you go back to the, the idea of these two modes. You don't have a new mode that can take 10 people door to door because the geometry doesn't allow for it, even though you have a big change in the user experience. And so I think one of the things that's been confusing in this whole discussion has been the personal, the transformation of the personal ex travel experience. People project that as though the geometry is changing when it hasn't. We're still in New York City. So the key question in all of this is how is the street used? And who decides um, how it's used and what the social norms are for its use? Uh, so if you go back 100, 125 years, the streets were all shared spaces. And if you see these great old black and white uh, movies of the herky-jerky, everyone moving around, it looks like complete chaos. And in fact, the fatality rate in use of the street could be quite high. You actually had, had trains running down avenues on the west side that were knocking people over left and right and were required for safety reasons to have somebody out in front. So the question about the street and street safety and street use is how should it be used? Who owns it? Who controls it? And I think equally important what the social norms are. Once the auto came along, the expectations for street use changed. It went from being a shared space to something that was allocated. And it was mostly allocated to the motor vehicle. So pedestrians, when they crossed the street, they became jaywalkers. And it was against the law. For a long time, the street was viewed as being the realm of the motor vehicle. Then the pedestrian rights became evident. And crosswalks, and you see this in New York today, crosswalks are clearly the realm of the pedestrian. And the cars stop. And when I saw a truck pull into the crosswalk this morning, I said to the driver, you shouldn't be here. And he didn't argue with it. Um, and so that has been the historic designation for many years in New York. The streets are for the motor vehicles. The crosswalks are for the pedestrian. Then we come to bikes. We come to buses. We come to other designations. And that is still being fought. Drivers say, that's my space. So when I, when I bike in the Bronx, I get honked at because the driver believes that's his space, not my space. Um, Scooters, we don't know where they're going to go because we don't know where, whose space, what, what space can safely be taken by a new mode like that. When I bike in a bike lane, there's pedestrians there because pedestrians don't recognize that as my space. They take it. People pushing shopping carts take it. So we still have all of this, like even when it's designated by the city, there's not a strong social norm. There's a social norm about crosswalks, I think, mostly obey. There's not a social norm about these other things. And you get a lot of exceptions, too. So we're here on Broadway. When I came in, there's a truck double parked in the travel lane and not across the street in the designated space that's open for truck loading, because it's more convenient to unload when you're adjacent to where you're unloading. So we need to not only designate the space in terms of who can use what, where, and when, but we need to reinforce that so people actually voluntarily do that as a sense, one, of like the city will work better, and they have an important role in making that happen. All right, so if you want to skip ahead a few years, so it's important to know when you're dealing with today and what you want to do today, it's important also to be thinking about ultimately where are we trying to get to. So it's important to have vision and leadership and then to take advantage of your opportunities as you go along to get there. I think the ultimate vision in a place like New York, particularly given the street grid, is to have a public transportation system that serves the vast majority of trips. 
we're not going to be adding lots and lots of milo, mileage to the subway system anytime, to, anytime soon. So that has to happen on the surface with buses. And the way to do that is to take advantage of the street grid that we have, that we've inherited from the early 19th century, and have buses run north and south, and buses run east and west in a very comprehensive way. And then to make them fast and reliable, and then to take all the friction out of the transfer. The big, the key thing here is that you can get from any point to any point in a street grid on, with two buses, making the transfer quick and reliable and comfortable. And if you can do that, people would use the bus. To do that, to get to that ultimate sort of a vision, the main thing that you need is less traffic. Right now, the way we're trying to get there is by designated lanes for buses. The buses go here, the cars go here, the bikes go here. You go to a place like Amsterdam or Copenhagen, and what you see is they don't designate space for different modes because there's not so much traffic that you even need to. And so I think a part of this vision is to have a lot less traffic and be able then that everyone can go where they need to and use the space. When you designate space, it's good because you're trying to clear out that space. It's problematic because one, we don't have the social norms that keeps it clear. Secondly, you need to deal with the geometry of that because you still need to allow access to local businesses. You still need to allow left and right turns. And it makes it awkward to have space dedicated to one use when others need to cross over it. If you just had less traffic, it would be easy to get around. I happen to bike early in the morning, and it's great because you can go wherever you want. You don't need a bike lane. You don't need a bus lane. You don't need anything. Everyone can maneuver and negotiate that on their own. And so I think ultimately that's where we want to get to. And, and having automation will help because it will lower the cost. Um, having things like uh, camera enforcement helps because it improves compliance with the rules that we have. Um, and so st I think step by step we can get there. We can get to that kind of a vision through technology, through changes now in how we use the streets. It'll be, it's a long haul. It's a long road, but I think that's what we should be aiming for. The vision is, I think, the place to start with this vision is in Manhattan because it has the most intensive use of the streets, the most intensive use of public transportation today. Over time, then, it can be expanded out to the rest of the city, um, certainly to the parts of the city, to the rest of the city where traffic is an issue, mobility options are an issue. Um, but the place to start is where the need is greatest, and that's clearly uh, Manhattan. So right now, what we have is this sort of big bifurcation of big high-capacity vehicles and then individual ve and vehicles carrying mainly one passenger or one traveling party. The reason we don't have in-between, the reason we don't have mini buses and 12 and 14 passenger vans is that the, is that the cost of transportation, for hire, any type of public transportation, the number one cost is the driver or the operator. And so why have a smaller vehicle when that cost remains the same? When you can automate that, it means that the cost is in the vehicle and in fuel is your main operating cost at that point. And so where it's appropriate, you could have more vehicles that are smaller and then could come more often and increase the frequency where you don't need the big vehicles. In Manhattan, you still need the big vehicles, so that's not what we're talking about. But there's plenty of other places where you don't need a vehicle that can carry 60 people, a vehicle that can carry 12 or 14 or 20 would be quite appropriate. And so you can downsize the cost of the vehicle as you downsize the vehicle size in an effective way. So anytime you talk about transportation, you ultimately start to talk about land use and housing. And the two issues with housing are number one, sort of just the construction of new housing and keeping up with increased demand. And then secondly, what that does to neighborhoods or what processes that's part of. And the big concern there is gentrification. I've started to look at this for some work that I'm planning to do. And the thing that strikes me in this is that one of the big issues in terms of like nimbyism and resistance to this, there's many issues, but one of the big issues is what kind of housing gets built? And from what I've seen on the research on this, the answer is 
to build housing that people are comfortable with, that are people that, that fit with the neighborhood, that people welcome to their neighborhood. And so I think from an architect standpoint, as someone who stands outside that profession but is in something closely related and they're really very interrelated in terms of how the city changes and grows, is to think about making housing people want in their neighborhood. And so then it becomes, well, how much, what do people want? And, and is that like exactly what they have now in terms of the height and, and the capacity of that? How do we get to a more intensive use of the land? And I think the main answer to that is to be bringing people housing, to look for opportunities for higher, higher density use that people can experience and say, hey, you know, that actually works for me. My fears have not borne out. All the work we did at New York City DOT, the thing that we worked off of over and over again is get something done. Let people see it, experience it, make it a success, make it things that people want. So people who ran, you know, you had a generation of city council members who ran against bike lanes and then a new generation that ran for them. Make that transition. So to have enduring change, the change has to be something that people want more of, not that a little bit gets done and stopped or even undone. And so the trick in this, and this is a very hard problem, and I don't mean to oversimplify it, but the trick in this is to look for the opportunities where people can get, for the agencies, for, the, for, for developers, whoever, can get something done, show what it, that it works out, challenge the city. If the, if the issue is enough classroom space, challenge the city to provide that elementary school space, right, or the public transportation service, and create the feedback loop that people see, well, this does work out, and there's follow-through where there needs to be follow-through, and my worst fears are not realized, and then you can get more of it. So traditionally, New York and maj other major cities were hub and spoke. You had a center, and then people came in and out of that hub and spoke system. It's been widely recognized that that's in many ways, although in many ways still functional, in many ways archaic, it's much more of a many-to-many -many system now. Um, and when you think of some occupations, like people who work in hospitals or schools, it's always been many-to-many, -many, and more and more it's becoming like that. That's one thing that's happened. Another thing that has happened is that the, the, the geographic extent of people coming into the center has expanded. So it's not just from Manhattan, the people working in midtown Manhattan, say, live. It's more and more neighborhoods throughout the boroughs. And the public transportation system doesn't necessarily serve those trips well either. So the many-to-many -many aspect is also, in some, case, in some cases, many to midtown or many to Manhattan as well. So already the pattern of transportation in the city has changed from what it historically was. That's only going to continue. Manhattan has grown, but the boroughs have grown in some cases more quickly than Manhattan. We all know Manhattan is very, you know, there's some capacity constraints at some point if we haven't already hit them. Um, and so I think the many-to-many -many problem is only going to grow more intensive. And what cities have been doing, Houston is a good example of this recently, is to redesign the bus network so that it's not radially oriented, but that it's grid oriented and the many to many. The street systems in the boroughs aren't necessarily conducive to this, the Bronx in particular because of the geography. Even where you have street grids, they then start to displace each other at odd angles because of the way they were developed. So it will be a challenge to do that, but we need to be working on ways to connect all of the many to many trip patterns that we have currently and that we'll only have more and more of in the future. So to address climate change, just within the transportation system, there's many things that we can be doing. One is we can emphasize and make more attractive, high capacity uh, public transportation that's inherently more energy efficient. It can be m made greener in terms of electric propulsion, obviously already the subway system, but also the buses. Um, we can green our four higher fleets as well. Um, and ultimately, the, you know, a big part of the solution, too, is to make the city grow. Technology is one way to address climate change. M shifting people between modes 
is an important way to address climate change. But the, in many ways, the biggest structural change is to have growth of population and growth of jobs, when you think nationally, happen where in cities that are large and dense, because those will be inherently the most efficient in terms of energy use, which drives global warming. Um, people living in row houses and apartment buildings instead of single family houses. People taking public transportation to work and for other trips instead of using their own car. And that happens in cities. It doesn't happen in suburbs. So we need to be growing cities and growing the density of cities. And where we have growth outside of cities, we need to be growing them in, a way, in ways that also have the density of use and the density of travel so that, that we realize those same um, low energy, low input. You can clean the input, but you can also change the volume of input. And both of those are, are critical to addressing the very severe GHG emission challenges that we clearly have. So I've worked on transportation issues since the mid-1980s. And you might think it gets a little old or you start to know everything. And then you have the system change and you're trying to understand new behaviors and you have surprises come along the way. So I thought, well, Uber and Lyft will get to the point of having shared trips, right? And where will that occur first? Well, that will occur in midtown Manhattan first because you'll have the density of trips to make the matches be efficient. And in fact, when you look at the data for their shared trips, it's very efficient. And it only takes a couple more minutes if you take a shared ride. The trip itself only takes a couple more minutes than if you had the exclusive ride like UberX. Um, but that's not what actually happened. Where has shared riding been most popular? It's been most popular late at night. And it's been most popular in like the outer parts of Brooklyn and Queens because the public transportation option isn't as robust. So if you wanted to save money, which is the main appeal of pooling, in Manhattan, you're already taking the subway or bus for the most part. But in the boroughs, maybe not. Maybe you're really looking for some other improved mode. Um, it turns out more late at night. I think that's partly because it's a younger crowd that's less time sensitive. I also think at a certain point of the evening, they're probably completely insensitive and don't really matter how long it takes um, to get home as long as they can reliably get home. So, those are the sorts of surprises that you see now. I always think about a story from way back when I worked at New York City Transit. We were doing some focus groups with people on the B41 bus that goes on Flatbush Avenue in Brooklyn. And it turned out to be a young, mainly a young African-American female group in this particular focus group. And I kind of wondered, well, why don't you take the two or three subway train instead of taking the B41 bus? It would be faster, wouldn't it? Is? And it turned out that the answer was, for these young women who were single mothers, that the half hour they spent on the B41 bus was the only time they had for themselves all day. So they could get a seat in downtown Brooklyn by the window and sit and listen to music or stare out the window or read or do whatever they wanted to. They didn't have the boss from work. They didn't have the kid crying at home. It was the time to themselves. And so sometimes you think about transportation, you think about speed of travel, comfort, cost. Those are the big drivers of mode choice. Sometimes it's something else. Sometimes it's, this is the time to myself. And me, look at me, I'm not going to figure that out, right? You have to go talk to people who are actually making those choices, who maybe live in a fairly different world than the world I live in, um, in terms of their personal circumstances. And even though they don't live far away from where I live in Brooklyn, you know, their answer to this question is quite different. And until you have that conversation, you don't understand that travel behavior. What worries me the most when I look at current trends in transportation in New York City is that we're having this shift from public transportation, from shared and efficient modes, to cars, be they for hire or individual cars. Car ownership in New York City is going up. That's what worries me the most because it's uh, not a way that the city, it's not the future for the city. The city can't live in that future. It certainly can't grow in that future. So that's the bad news. The good news is that the bad news is getting pretty bad and people see it every day. They see it in the traffic, they see it in the transit system. And there's an increasing outcry to do something about it. And so we have 
going into effect in January, a fee on four higher rides. We have a moratorium on new licenses. We don't have congestion pricing yet. We don't have dedicated increased um, money to the MTA. We don't have all the reforms that we need in terms of how the MTA spends the money and manages it, the operations. But we have been working toward that. And there are very talented people working at the MTA in New York City Transit working on that. And so I think the push is there, the need to push the recognition, the public consensus behind that. The politics need to play out a little bit better than they are right now, perhaps. There's a lot more to do, but I think the reaction has certainly set in to the trends that we see. Um, and there's a, there's a recognition of where we need to get to. And I think when New Yorkers put their mind to it, they'll get to where they need to get to. So I think the way that the, that the governor's uh, commission, the Fix New York panel last year, designed a cordon pricing scheme is something that you can put in place in very short order. I worked very extensively on this um, a decade ago. I know the technology, technology has improved. The ability to do this is something that you could just go and do right now. So that makes perfect sense. In a longer term, you want to be charging people for the mileage they drive in congested streets, a vehicle mile tax makes sense, but we're not quite there yet. You could start that with four hire vehicles, you could start that with commercial vehicles that are operated by fleets. Those would be good things to be phasing in. But the first thing that we need to do is get a congestion pricing system in place using proven technology that's been used in global cities that we know will work um, and to all that stands in the way, really, is the political will to do that. So part of what I, so I put out a bunch of ideas. One idea I put out was for, for hire vehicles, taxis, Uber, Lyft, and the like. Instead of charging, so what the, what the state adopted was a per trip fee, which I think makes a lot of sense in Manhattan, because you really want to charge the beginning of the trip more than anything else. You want to have a higher charge on a percentage basis of the fare of a short trip that would be most easily taken by other modes. You want to be charging for the mileage in Manhattan. So on an airport trip, you really just want to charge the Manhattan mileage. And so a fixed fee functions pretty well in that. What the fixed fee doesn't do is charge for all the time between trips the vehicles running around empty, clogging traffic, but not transporting anybody. So I said, you should charge for that on an hourly basis. Now, we're going to get there through another means, because meanwhile, there's been a lot of concern about driver wages in the for hire sector. The city council recently adopted, and the, TLC, the taxi commission is now putting out rules um, to increase the efficiency of the use of those vehicles so that more of their time has passengers and less of their time is empty. That's the same goal of an hourly fee that I talked about last winter is now being done for the purpose of driver wages. So you get to the same result through a different route, that's fine, um, and has additional benefit as well. So the governor's Fix NYC panel proposed a cordon pricing scheme across 60th Street, East River, and Hudson River. So vehicles coming into that zone or traveling within the zone would be charged. I think that makes good sense to do. It would use technology that's proven, that exists. You can go get it manufactured quickly. Um, you know that it's going to work. Uh, the only thing that we're missing there is the political will to adopt that system. So that's what we need to work on. Um, over time, we should then be substituting uh, vehicle mile uh, charge system so that you're not charged just to come in but how much you drive within the zone. That technology is still under development. It's not proven, it's not really been done anywhere. Singapore is starting to do it. Let's first do the system that we know will work and can be done quickly, and then move toward a more refined um, system over time. So I think there's two things people can do. One is individual and, and, and one is is group. Individually, when people have a choice that's a close call or have good options, I could take Uber or I could take the bus, to lean, to tilt that toward what's more efficient, toward what's less 
produces less in terms of greenhouse gas emissions and the like. I'm not saying remake your life. I'm saying give a bias toward the societal outcome. The other thing I would say is do everything you can to join with other people to say fund the MTA. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Jen Robertson. I'm here from the Mayor's Office of Sustainability. Uh, here today to talk to you about our transportation related work. We like to re release reports, we're really into it. Uh, we started this work in 2013 with the Plan NYC technical feasibility to getting to an 80% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions by 2050. Uh, moving forward from there, we released the 80 by 50 report in 2015, which is a roadmap to how to get there. And uh, last year, we recommitted to the Paris Climate Agreement, which is our 1.5 climate action plan, so towards the end of that arrow there. Uh, our main mandate, once again, is the reduction of greenhouse gas emissions. There are four teams that work on this within our office. Uh, I myself am on the energy and infrastructure team, so anything related to infrastructure investments and renewables and energy is within our team's portfolio. Uh, our team's a bit unique since we are cross-listed between sustainability and resiliency, so we have both uh, climate change mitigation, so reducing emissions, and climate change uh, uh, related adaptations, so resiliency built into our team's mandate. Uh, we also have folks working on communications and marketing, strategic initiatives, and building and energy efficiency. Uh, buildings is our top emitter in New York City, so we have a specific team working on that. Our key partnerships, so we do work with the private sector, and I'll speak more to this in, in a little bit around our climate challenges. Our main constituency that I'm most invested in, in working with are our New Yorkers, are yourselves by and large, uh, and beyond this room as well. So working with New Yorkers around our Green NYC campaigns. We recently uh, gave a bunch of water bottles out to New York youth to get them engaged in waste reduction, so that sort of work, as well as engaging New Yorkers to you know, show up to the polls and make sure that we're speaking to your needs in the local laws that we pass. Uh, New York State advocacy, so this uh, plays out a lot in the renewables, so trying to uh, create better access to upstate clean energy and hopefully getting transmission down to New York City to make our grid more renewable and more resilient and more sustainable. And on the federal level as well, we do do a lot of advocacy right now, I mean, especially given the current administration. Uh, recently, I helped draft our office's uh, CAFE standard rollback comments, which we are not in favor of, um, unsurprisingly, so that would be an example of uh, advocacy that we do. So, as mentioned, we, we uh, signed on to the Paris Climate Agreement last year. This is through Executive Order 26. Uh, the principles and goals of the Paris Climate Agreement federally, the United States pulled out, so we said that's unacceptable, we have to recommit. Um, this is working a variety of stakeholders, cities, regions, private sector, public health, activists, um, architects, yourselves, definitely, uh, to make sure that we have even more ambitious goals in place to get to where we need to be in terms of climate change mitigation to limit global temperature rise to 1.5 degrees Celsius. And I'm sure we'll t speak to this more so on the panel, but we do know that at this point we need to be even more aggressive than the goals you've already committed to as per the IPCC report. So my piece of the puzzle is transportation, second highest emitter in New York City at around 30% of citywide emissions. In terms of on-road transportation, which is the topic of today's conversation, uh, passenger vehicles actually make up the bulk of on-road related greenhouse gas emissions, which I was surprised by. I think, you know, we have such a robust transit network, we have city bike, we have people who can walk because our neighborhoods are so dense and you can kind of live where you work more so than, you know, not to be taken for granted compared to lots of other areas of the country, you know, the suburbs where that's less of a reality, for example. But it's still a huge bulk of our emissions. So the two goals that we're working on in terms of transportation right now, the, the main goal that uh, Bruce spoke to as well is to get people to drive less often. So our goal is to have an 80% sustainable mode share by 2050. Um, as per last year, we're at around 62%. Sustainable mode share that looks like people taking transit, walking or biking, as opposed to driving in a vehicle. Uh, the remaining 20% of trips that are taken using a vehicle, we want those vehicles to be alternative fueled, so low emission or ideally zero tailpipe emission vehicles. Uh, our goal around that in electrification is to have 20% of new vehicles registered in New York City be electric by 2025. 
Um, to give you some context, we're at less than 1% currently. We're at actually 0.2%, so it's definitely a pretty uh, large hurdle to get over to get to that 20% adoption rate. Uh, there's around 5,000 electric vehicles registered in New York City right now, so we do have a, a long ways to go. And a lot of our infrastructure investments that we're very focused on in our office is really speaking to, to getting there. Uh, another thing to mention as well, so I said 83% uh, of greenhouse gas emissions that are transportation related on road come from uh, passenger vehicles. Another reality that is interesting to, to me is that most of those emissions actually come from trips that begin and end in the outer boroughs. So though there's a lot of focus on congestion management in the core and what congestion pricing could look like in the core of Manhattan in particular, in terms of GHG impacts, we have to be looking at the outer boroughs as well. So trips that aren't readily available by transit from the Bronx to, to Brooklyn or you know the Queens to Brooklyn connection on transit is definitely a frustration that, that I feel every week when I go visit uh, friends of mine. So it's definitely something that we're, we're well aware of. So in terms of the mode shift, so we uh, need by 2050 uh, a reality where some trips will no longer need to be taken due to improvements in technology, um, as well as modes being shifted to lower carbon modes. So thinking of the proliferation of teleworking, which is that kind of first uh, bar on the on the visual there, uh, the shift of people carpooling, then maybe they could be improving that via trip further by carpooling an electric vehicle carpooling to taking a bus or mass transit, which could be electrified as well. I always say subways are our hugest electrified mode we already have in New York City and have had for uh, well over a century now. Uh, looking into uh, also getting for higher vehicle trips to go towards uh, kind of bike share and biking when possible. And in terms of freight, we're looking at freight being fueled using alternative uh, fuels as well. So our infrastructure investments promote the shift to sustainable modes in this particular realm. So the piece of the puzzle within transportation that I'm most focused on right now, so just to kind of zero in on it more, is uh, EV ownership and EV adoption. So like this map a lot, it really shows where we are right now in terms of EV adoption in New York City. To demystify the map a bit, the darker the purple, the more EVs are located there. And those little um, orange splotches are where publicly available level two chargers are in the city. These are chargers that could charge a vehicle in around four to six hours or so. And the very few green dots up there that are a bit more desperate, uh, those are fast chargers. So those charge a vehicle in around half an hour or so. Um, so right now, we actually rank last in terms of 20, the top 25 major metropolitans in the United States in terms of charging access. Uh, around half of New Yorkers park on street at least some of the time uh, due to lack of garage or driveway access. Some of the time is because of alternate side parking, so some people may do the parking garage once a week to you know, avoid needing to move their car or find a, a parking spot in a very inconvenient location. Uh, and in terms of charging access as well, we can see the majority of the splotches that are these little dots are in Manhattan, south of 110th Street. This is an area that I personally believe people don't really need to be driving as often. This is where the wealth of our transit access exists in the city. And again, these emissions are coming from outer borough trips by and large. Interesting as well, so Staten Island has some, a few pretty dark purple splotches there. People with garages and driveways. So again, this charging access is a, a huge issue. If you have a, a garage or driveway, you can put a charger in your garage or driveway. You can plug it in even into a wall outlet and get, you know, 10 hours later, you'll have a full charge on most vehicles. But if you're someone without that access and you have a, a car, how do you get your, your mode to be electrified and more sustainable? So our answer to this is uh, electrifying transportation through investments in infrastructure. So right now we're working for our Department of Transportation on a $10 million investment in fast charging. Again, these are half an hour for full charge chargers. Uh, we're working with the utility, Con Edison, and our DOT as well on an on-street charging pilot. So think of areas where you'd see a metered parking spot. Imagine that being an EV charger as well. So that's what we're working on right now for 120 parking spots that will be outfitted with these chargers, which we're really excited about. And uh, our DOT also works on creating charging access within their own lots and garages, which is already heavily subsidized parking. So usually around uh, $10 an hour maximum. So adding some chargers there to make sure that the parking that for better or, or arguably worse, we're subsidizing to make sure that the vehicles that are parked there are ideally electric and trying to ramp that up. 
So back to the, the private sector. So this past, uh, actually a year ago now, we released the NYCX Climate Challenge. Um, this was a challenge uh, talking to tech and private sector. How would you solve our electrification problem? Uh, trying to get the most innovative solutions to find out you know, what's coming down the pipe from our partners and industry to really you know, make sure our policy goals are up to date. Uh, we got over three dozen uh, different companies uh, putting in a uh, kind of proposal towards this. We had solar canopies, we had breakthrough technologies where we had one proposal was integrating electrification into our sidewalks and using the movement of cars and people to in some way electrify our, our cities. They, they didn't win, but definitely very interesting concept. Uh, we had energy harnessing infrastructure, uh, connected vehicle to grid, and we know that the utility is currently actually doing a pilot of vehicle to grid technology in Westchester that we're really interested in the results of. Uh, but the winner actually was a company that integrates EV charging into streetlight poles. Um, so that would be using an existing infrastructure and integrating charging into, into that. So in terms of our fleet, um, so we have a more aggressive goal of greenhouse gas emission reductions in fleet. Um, that looks like having 80% reduction by 2035. Uh, currently, we are ahead of schedule in terms of our adoption of EVs for fleets. We want 2,000 EVs by 2025. We have 1,700. We're going to meet that goal next year, most likely ahead of schedule. Uh, we are the largest municipal electrified fleet in the United States. Uh, we have 500 level two chargers in our fleet. That's the largest charging network in New York State. Uh, 37 of those chargers are solar powered entirely, so not at all grid connected. So you're getting 100% renewable energy there. Uh, $10 million is allocated to fast charging, which is also fantastic. And we actually are looking into alternative fuels as a turnkey solution for our medium and heavy duty vehicles. Uh, so using renewable diesel, which is only 1% fossil fuel based, uh, to fuel our medium and heavy duty vehicles until we have electrified models that are available that could meet their operational needs. Right now there's not a lot of uh, electrified trucks and, uh, and garbage trucks and, and so on and so forth that we can actually use yet. So um, as a turnkey solution for now. So freight, um, definitely freight is a huge concern for us in terms of emissions. 41% of New Yorkers rece receive a delivery at least once a week. 90% of our freight movements in New York City actually take place on a truck. And we have uh, 120,000 trucks that cross in and out of our boundaries every day, which is a huge, a huge number. Uh, our Department of Transportation right now is working on a clean trucks management program. They have a, an off-hour delivery program they're looking to expand in 2019. That looks like adding 900 customers to that program. It incentivizes deliveries between 7 p.m. and 6 a.m. when we have less congestion uh, and works on also noise mitigation as well to make sure that residents aren't having negative impacts from that. Uh, our uh, Economic Development Commission also is working on a free NYC plan, and I know that my colleague Adam Lebasny will be speaking to that later on today, and we're excited to see what comes of the, the Clean Trucks program in particular. So we still have a long way to go, definitely I'm not naive. We have a lot of things that we need, still need to be doing in terms of climate change mitigation, and our office is definitely committed to doing so. Um, I still like to think that every day our work is really continuing to grow and build to an even stronger, more sustainable, more resilient, and more equitable city. So still work to be done, but excited to hear what you all think of this work so far today. Hi, everybody. Still with us. Okay. So, um, I am a sociologist, and I'm going to sound a little bit different than what we've heard so far. Um, I have just published this book called Mobility Justice, The Politics of Movement in an Age of Extremes. Uh, you can actually read chapter two for free. On, it's currently running on Verso blogs, if you go to Verso blogs um, online. And what I do in the book is try to move us beyond the transportation justice approach and the spatial justice approach, which I think are too circumscribed around the boundaries of cities and urban policy, and they don't look enough at the big picture across scales. So what I do in the book is I try to look across scales of bodies, transportation or streets, urban space and the sort of infrastructures that support it, transnational mobility across borders, and planetary circulation of energy and resources. So the 
idea of mobility justice is to look at mobility at all of these different scales. And overall, the aim is to think about mobilities as kinopolitical, that is, the political as mobile and mobility as political. And that includes attention to concepts of differential mobility, uneven mobilities, network capital, potential mobility, mobility capabilities, and mobility justice. Now, I'm not going to go through all that today, but that's the background that informs the kind of work I'm doing, which is about how uneven mobilities are the basis of political relations. Who's a citizen? Who can enter the public sphere? Who makes decisions and plans, including transportation and urban plans? And who is excluded? In fact, the capability for mobility could be considered constitutive of political relations. Oops. There we go. Okay, so what I'm going to do today is talk about instead future scenarios um, against a lot of influential consultancy thinking, planning, and policy that focuses on near term effects of technology and of market disruption as like the main drivers of innovation. I would draw on a social futures approach that comes out of the work of John Uri, um, who is uh, uh, my late um, colleague who I worked with at Lancaster University in developing the new mobilities paradigm. And I'm going to draw on his book, What is the Future? And the social futures approach combines complexity theory, nonlinear processes, unintended consequences, questions of timing and competing actors to describe unstable adaptive systems that are fragile, uncertain, and unpredictable. So crucial to this is what uh, Anthony Townsend referred to earlier as powerful actors with agendas. So I'm going to talk about four scenarios, um, the fast mobility city, the digital city, the livable city, and the fortress city. And these are drawn from um, Ari's work. And it's about looking out towards sort of 2050, not looking at future is kind of built from scratch, like smart cities. I'm not talking about like Songdo in Korea or Mazdar or even sidewalk labs in Toronto, but what forces are shaping actually existing urbanism? So let me begin with the fast mobility city. This future rests on ever more speedy, extensive mobile lives for the kinetic elite, that is the people with the highest capabilities for mobility. It's a city of growth, movement, investment, ease, and enticement for the wealthy. I use uh, Hudson Yard's development as a sort of stand-in, a metaphor, for how here real estate investment, job growth, urban population growth will emerge as clusters of vertical towers predicated on the ease of well-connected travel for the kinetic elite who will continue to make the city center increasingly expensive. This is the world of big engineering firms, um, star architects, high paid consultants, luxury real estate developers. Think WSP Parsons Brinkerhoff, the related companies. Think about the architects who did the master planning, Cohen Peterson Fox, and the architects who are designing the buildings, right? SOM, Diller, um, Scofidio and Renfro, Foster and Partners, Robert Stern, et cetera. Also think about the United States EB-5 investor visa program, right, which lets the buyers buy in and get uh, US visas. Think about the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange as the financial capital that's going into this. So in, oops, in this city, you'll recognize um, this is from the promotion for Volvo's um, automated driverless cars. Tiered premium surfaces will give the elite access to fast mobility, including possibly high-speed rail, but especially luxury car services, easy airport access, privately owned luxury automated vehicles. Driverless cars will become mobile meeting spaces for on-the-move work. And meanwhile, flexible on-demand workers will serve them in mobile workspaces, blurring the distinction between buildings and vehicles, between offices and transit spaces. There will be on-demand delivery services by drone and automated robots. Think of you know, Amazon Prime, Whole Foods, crossed with Uber Eats, Grubhub, and an automated drone delivery service. There'll be premium access, you know, like we see already with Easy Pass toll roads, global entry, TSA pre-check, differentiated travel classes, high-speed rails to airports. 
cities will be increasingly vertical and orbited by many kinds of passenger and robotic aerial vehicles, including micro drones in swarms, space scrapers in core global cities, increasing social inequality in this vertical city as elites escape the masses, including growth in air travel, multi-local work and residence, and second and third home ownership, fourth, fifth, whatever. Many will be excluded from this high cost vertical city and life will be segregated into the protected groups with high mobility capital and the mobility poor who will most suffer the consequences of labor exploitation, displacement, and climate change. Large scale vertical farms like this dragonfly vertical farm concept by Vincent Calibo Architectures um, will augment local food production, perhaps replacing long distance sourcing of high end perishables. This will require the emergence of post-carbon energy systems and a cluster of reinforcing innovations, possibly hydrogen power and fuel cells, requiring a whole new production and distribution system. Uh, and you'll see, I mean, this is a bit fanciful, right? These are extremes, but it kind of gives you a feel for what might be coming. Many will also be excluded from this city, as I said, and life will be increasingly segregated. In contrast to the kind of cheery projections of automatic vehicles solving our uh, congestion and pollution problems, like this quote from President Obama, um, Sperling and, and others describe the potential for a nightmare transportation scenario in 2040, where increasing AV usage only leads to more vehicle usage, more urban sprawl, declining transit use, privacy violations, and increased inequity. It's a city of extreme injustices. And the kinetic elite, in a sense, secede from the masses, not by going to the suburbs, but by going vertical and going fast. And people are, other people are exposed to deteriorating conditions, externalization of pollution and waste. So that's one kind of pretty negative vision of the future. Now let's look at the digital city. Um, and this is uh, a city envisioned by what I call digital capital, right? Al Apple, Alphabet, Sidewalk Labs, IBM Smart Cities. It offers widespread substitution of physical movement of objects and people by many modes of digital communication and experience. Digital experiences will replace co-presence. Physical environments will become smart and connected. The internet of things sensing and adapting to people as they move through it. Objects interacting independently through algorithms, smart controllers, and artificial intelligence. People will move around virtually using digital doubles and interacting with intangible digital information using hand gestures. When most people do move physically, they will opt for shared, connected, and increasingly automated cars enriched with virtual reality and augmented reality capacities. So already we see the promotion of this. This is a quote, the windshield of your car is a perfect example of something that can use augmented reality. Currently, this takes the form of a head-up display, but those capabilities will continue to improve. Soon, the entire windshield will have information about what can be seen through it, um, you know, and there's different imagined scenarios of what this will look like. So there's different approaches to looking at the smart mobility transition. On the one hand, we see a tech innovation approach, which is what I describe as a remediation of private automobility, drawing on Grusin's idea of remediation. We see continued dominance of car companies, which now have become mobility companies, continued investment by carbon capital, integrating information tech into existing transport systems, leveraging big data, open data, uh, intelligent roadways, et cetera. On the other hand, we have more of a systems innovation approach, which is kind of pushing towards a post-automobility shared virtual and augmented mobility system. Here we see more participation by the disruptive digital capital, and the vision involves more shared transportation networks, fractional use, collaborative mobility, mobility as a service. So both of those are in play, but I want to focus not on the tech and not on the innovation, but on the social. And I draw here on Glenn Lyon's um, article, Transport's Digital Age Transition, where he talks about how this, what this means for people. People will use forms of physical and virtual mobility interchangeably. He calls this multi-mobilities that will enable people to be flexible and responsive. People will more easily adjust their mobility split between physical and virtual, that is motorized, non-motorized, physical and you know, online. 
Distinctions between activity time and travel time will continue to blur as we move seamlessly between physical, augmented, and virtual encounters. Workers in the knowledge economy will have an increasingly weak link between where they live and who they work for and with. Car ownership will seem increasingly less important and car use will seem increasingly banal. Shared use of mobility resources will be favored. The car will be seen as a background technology serving a purely functional purpose. That's why car companies don't want this to happen, right? This is not on their agenda. Um, I, we could also think of this in terms of uh, what Adam Greenfield has called transmobility. So pod-like connected vehicles will open with a super fob that will stream personalized navigation, music, media, and internet content. It will handle route selection, parking, and payment automatically. Street, streets and buildings will be permeated with ubiquitous computing, the Internet of Things, a sea of sensors. Fleets of shared electric automated vehicles will follow the pattern established by existing car sharing and, and vehicle sharing practices. There will be extensive costing of the curb, congestion pricing, and controlled parking to limit private vehicle access, except for the kinetic elite who will be able to afford it still. Um, also, uh, 3D printing and additive manufacturing will spawn new logistics spaces, right, with fab labs and local warehouses linked by artificial intelligence to Amazon delivery systems. So the downside of this, according to Greenfield, um, if, I don't know if you've seen his book Radical Technologies that sort of debunks a lot of the new technologies, is a loss of locality, a loss of empathy, a shallowing of experience, a potential cascading effect of system disruptions, and people who live nowhere in particular, but become digital nomads, maybe using small apartments on wheels, capsule hotels, and shared spaces. This kind of digital city also implies a high degree of tracking, data collection, loss of privacy, and a lot of surveillance and digital policing. There will be a loss of shared civic culture, decline of what Elijah Anderson called the cosmopolitan canopy, or what some call social infrastructure, increasing gentrification, lack of affordable housing anywhere near the city center, and workers will face impersonal algorithmic control in the gig economy and long hours due to challenging commutes. If we want to preserve any sense of access to the city, we'll have to fight for open data and net neutrality at the very least. So I'm moving along quickly here. I want to get to the third vision, which is the livable city. This is a city developing new practices to power down and reduce carbon intensity. This is the city of green entrepreneurs, bike advocates, Jeanette Sadiq Khan, placemakers, transit-oriented development, uh, maybe even Europhiles and eco-socialists. Cycling will be more important, um, as we already see happening, with small, light, connected, smart, and potentially autonomous vehicle sharing systems mixed in with this cycling infrastructure, which we'll see fully built out uh, with greater pedestrian safety, along with green buildings, green stormwater management, more open spaces, renewable distributed energy grids, uh, active transport and electric vehicle sharing, along with hopefully much improved public transit investment and gradually the private car will become obsolete in such a city. This future would draw upon innovations currently being undertaken by you know, NGOs and think tanks and some uh, planners, which are encouraging collaboration, using design as a transformative tool, involving the community in placemaking, rejuvenating existing spaces, improving connectivity, and creating new destinations. Cities will possibly fragment into smaller scale systems of neighborhoods, which would be more self-sufficient and less rigidly zoned. High energy mobility machines would be less important in these kinds of livable cities, and center sprawl patterns would dissolve. As heavier fossil fuel driven vehicles are phased out, there will be an increase in distributed electric vehicle microgrids supporting e-bikes, e-scooters, e-cargo, and other electric small shared mobility systems. The balance between roads for cars and pathways for cyclists and pedestrians will be fundamentally transformed with far more space allocated to active forms of mobility. And we might see the development, which was also mentioned earlier, of autonomous rapid transit, with Ke which Peter Calthorpe has been promoting, one of the big advocates of um, transit-oriented development. 
Many cities would in effect become car free as is already happening in cities like Madrid, Paris, Hamburg, Helsinki, Milan, Oslo, and Copenhagen. Neighborhoods would become higher density in general and function at smaller scales with work, school, local production and consumption and repair all occurring near where people live, implying a systematic reduction in the distances that need to be traveled by people, objects, goods, and money. Um, this somewhat of a downside of this, of course, would be what we could think of as mobility austerity, right? That it requires political push to put limits on car use, limits on automobility, whether using congestion pricing, carbon pricing, personal carbon budgets, parking scarcity, road diets, delivery restrictions, and possibly this new concept of universal basic mobility, which is kind of like universal basic income, but for mobility. So I consider that a somewhat more positive scenario than the others. And these scenarios are, they're, they're happening now, right? There's trends towards all of these things. They're fighting with each other. And now I'm going to give you the most grim one, Fortress City. This is my last scenario. Um, this is the AT&T building at 33 Thomas Street called the Long Lines Building. It used to hold the um, solid state switches. It's now used as a high security data center. So metaphorically, in the Fortress City, rich societies and rich people will break away from the poor into fortified enclaves where they will secure their own infrastructure and means of life. This is in the face of climate change, climate disruption, possible market failures, you know, the real downside vision of what could happen. Those able to live in gated, armed bunker buildings will do so, and many city functions that were once public will be privatized, policing, trash collection, water management, power grids. You know, this is already starting to happen in some places. Outside such enclaves will be wild zones. This is the city of Halliburton and Blackwater, of the builders of walls and private prisons, of private security and bunkers and nuclear silos. These fortress walled cities and entire countries will be highly securitized and the outside world will be considered highly dangerous. This is the US-Mexico border wall. Systems of long distance mobility will only be accessible to the very rich. The kinetic elite will travel mainly in armed helicopters or light aircraft and personal drones. Pollution will be exported outside such enclaves, contributing to extreme environmental degradation elsewhere, accompanied by highly polluting resource extraction to feed the fortress cities. Wars over oil, gas, and water shortages will regularly disrupt critical infrastructures of mobility, energy, and communication, so most people will rely on redundant backup systems that are private. And, you know, in a very really small sense, we see this mentality in what's called dark design, right? Unpleasant design, like the benches that you roll off if you try to lie down on them, or um, the little barriers here to keep you from either sitting in the corner or unzipping in the corner because it will splash back on your feet, gentlemen. Um, so dark design is something that keeps people off benches, keeps skateboarders off of street furniture, and you know, stops us from doing the kinds of things we might do with our bodies in cities. Uh, this is an urban world foreshadowed in the bombing of the cities of Syria, in the suicide bombings of Afghan and Iraqi cities, in the starvation of Yemen. It's a kind of Mad Max dystopia with wars waged by private mercenaries, informal bands of armed boys and teenagers, as well as robotic weaponry. There will be interminable endings to such wars, no fixed fronts, no treaties, and no peace processes. So this is obviously the worst case scenario, and it's what we want to avoid, but it's worth thinking about critical infrastructure breakdown and what it means if we don't do the right thing now. So in concluding, I just want to talk very briefly about moving towards mobility justice. New mobilities, such as bike sharing and car sharing and smart connected cars and automated vehicles will only promote sustainability in a very limited sense if not coupled with a wider analysis of kinopolitical power relations at many scales. The new mobilities paradigm offers a way to think about these more complex problems across scale from the bodily to the urban to the national to the planetary. A new 
regime involves reorganizing society over many decades, writes John Uri, including its transportation system, population distribution, and the nature of work and sociability. The group, The Untokening, speak about how mobility justice demands that we fully excavate, recognize, and reconcile the historical and current injustices experienced by communities with impacted groups given space and resources to envision and implement planning models and political advocacy on streets and mobility that actively works to address historical and current injustices experienced by communities. So if we don't do that, we're just going to be letting those forces of those four different scenarios kind of fight it out amongst themselves and those with the most power will win. So how can individuals and societies around the world break the social ordering of choices, problems, and practices that continue to reinforce unbridled use of energy. With greater attention to the temporalities of energy embedded in everyday infrastructures, we might be able to better grasp the cultural changes needed to transform the underlying technoculture of speed and power. And this requires uh, a deeper kind of post-carbon transition. And here I draw on some of the arguments of Frank Gilles, who says we need a relative shift from the dominant science, technology, and innovation mode of innovation, which emphasizes upstream research and development and investment in green technologies. And what he argues for instead is a DUI mode of doing, using, and interacting, which emphasizes learning by doing, learning by using, and broader social interactions in green reconfigurations of concrete transport and energy systems. So finally, for me, mobility transitions have to be about social justice. In order to address the current limits and challenges of the exi existing system of automobility, we need to create an infrastructure of the future which addresses social inequities that underpin the unsustainability of our current system. While new solutions and innovations have the capacity to disrupt, these are, disruptions are not inherently conducive to sustainability, livability, or economically vital communities, or socially equitable and fair ones. Countervailing trends toward unequal mobilities, digital divides, and secessionist fortressing will undermine green trends. We need a dual transition towards environmentally sustainable mobility and greater mobility justice to ensure that future urban mobility transitions will not entrench even greater social inequities, exclusions, and externalization of harms. So I argue that we need to have planning processes that reject technological determinism or market inevitability, and we need to work to bring stakeholders together to ensure deliberative and procedural justice, facilitate communication, and purposefully build more equitable new mobility futures, which might require political struggle beyond just you know, planning and design. Thank you.